So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, wherever you are, some Europeans, some West Coasters, East Coasters, and Israelis. It's really great to see all of you, and thank you for joining us today for our third session in the series of five meetings that we're having on the climate crisis as part of the Green Funders Quorum Programming here at JFN. Um, just a quick reminder, first of all, if you don't, don't know me, I'm Sigali Anif Feller, I'm Executive Director of JFN Israel. I'm also a lifelong uh, environmentalist, who have been active in the environmental field for many, many, many years and a strong passion to it. And I, I really feel like this is the biggest challenge that we as humanity, we as a philanthropic community are facing at the moment and we need to figure out what we can do about it. And I know that it's something I go to sleep with and wake up with every morning, really trying to figure out. So part of that notion and feeling, and I know that it's shared by many of you, brought us, me, Marla, Gil, to develop this series. The first two sessions were focused one, the first one was mainly framing the issue and starting to talk about what it looks like globally and what it looks like in Israel. The second session zoomed into intersections between climate change and other fields of giving to really make the case that it doesn't matter if you're an environmental funder or not, it intersects with almost every field and fields of giving and there is something everyone can do about it. And even if it's funding it directly or indirectly. So that was the second session. And today the third session is starting to zoom into the um, level of the civil society and game-changing strategies um, tackling climate change. There are, of course, endless examples of nonprofits that are working in this field and they're growing on, on a daily um, rate all around the globe. We chose only several of them to share on this short Zoom, but we really want to bring a diverse view of different opportunities to really show from this vast, huge issue what it looks like when people are actually doing work about it and activism about it and of course collaborating with philanthropists to help them um, and support the work that they're doing to try to make a difference and it's very clear to all of us that it's not a work that any one of us single-handedly could do only if we come together as a community both globally locally um, we can really make a difference um, I think it was Barack Obama said that our generation is the first generation that's really feeling the impact of climate change, but the last generation that could still do something about it. And with that thought that's constantly haunting me in my mind, we're really um, trying to bring people together and to help each and every one of you individually think about where it meets you and what we can do about it. So that's really our framing of today's session. And without... Um, any further information, I want to hand it the stage over to Marla Stein, my partner in crime here that has been working with me over the past few years in really reviving the Green Funders Forum in JFN and uh, working very actively towards promoting the environmental agenda in the philanthropic community. So Marla, thank you, and I'm handing it over to you. Thank you, Sial. And again, I want to congratulate you on your newly appointed position as executive director of JFN Israel. Very big congratulations. And also thanks to Gil Yako, Gil uh, in the blonde, curly blonde hair, who is the consultant to the Green Funders Forum. And it really is a pleasure to work together as a team. And you may note that I always call myself the co-chair. There are other people out there who know who you are that um, we are always so happy for your input and for your history with us. In the, and we're looking forward to um, whoever would like to rejoin us on the Screen Funders team. Uh, and I am Marla, Marla Stein, and I am, uh, as we said, the co-chair of the Green Funders Forum. We seek to be the address for people funding in the environment or for people who are interested in learning more. And I want to clarify, you absolutely do not need to consider yourself to be an environmental funder to be on this call or part of this forum. I think people are kind of generally confused. It's our mission to raise awareness and hopefully help be a resource to move people to action, but you don't need to consider yourself at that point um, at, this, at this juncture. So wherever you are on your journey, uh, we are just delighted for you to be here. On the climate crisis, as Seagal said, we have no time to lose. We have less than 10 years to act and all funders, with whatever your mission or your field of expertise, have an immense potential for positive impact. Um, in this session, we'll have a taste from NGO game-changing strategies on climate change. 
We'll be delighted if you can join us for sessions four and five, but each session is standalone in its own right. Our next session will be on January 10th, and it will be about philanthropic responses, lessons and opportunities. So be sure to register for that as well, or I will be writing you multiple emails. So please register. And we are putting that registration link in the chat. Today, we have three guest speakers, starting with Moran Dement from Life and Environment, which is the umbrella organization of Israel's environmental movement. All three, Moran will give us an overview of the, of the NGOs and their influential mm -hmm. strategies. After Moran, we will hear from two other speakers, each one focusing on a different strategy, one on climate finance and one on youth activism. Each speaker will be followed by a short question and answer session. So please note your questions in the chat. With that, I'm delighted to introduce Moran Dement. Moran is the professional development manager at Life and Environment, which as I mentioned, is the umbrella organization for Israel's environmental movement. Moran worked and volunteered for many environmental organizations as well as private sector companies. Um, those include the Paris Center for Peace, the Strauss Food Tech Incubator, called The Kitchen, Echo Traders, Green Course, and many more, working on various environmental issues. Moran holds an MA in Environmental Management and Development and an MA in, Dip in Diplomacy, both from Australia, the Australian National University. Moran will share some game-changing strategies of the environmental movement in Israel and globally. And I wanna say that I know Moran personally, and she is absolutely lovely intelligent and um, so committed to this cause. So it's really a pleasure to welcome you, Moran. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Good, good evening. Um, thank you, Mara, for the, for the introduction. I would just like to start with that. I haven't spoken in English in a professional capacity for a very long time. And so I'm a little bit nervous. And just bear with me if I get stuck with the English or I get a lot of ums in between my sentences. Um, so in you know, it, there's one. So um, thank you for the opportunity. And I would like to start with a presentation. So I was just share the presentation. Hang on. Can everyone see this? Yeah, okay, cool. So, um, I'm speaking with you as a as a employee of Life and Environmental um, uh, Life and Environment NGO, which is the like Marla said, is the umbrella of organization of the environmental movement. What we do in um, in the last five or four years, this is what I call the Life and Environment 2.0. We try to um, um, uh, hang on, hang on, <laughs> sorry. Um, we try to, to provide service for the NGOs, for over 130 NGOs that are members of, uh, of life and environment. We do this through capacity building, through coalition, creating coalition. All what we all want to do, our mission in life is to create a, an effective and a professional environmental movement in Israel in order for the change that we want to create to be um, resonating in in different um, NGOs and in different sectors throughout throughout Israel, whether it's the governmental and um, the governmental bodies, and the sector and the um, business sector. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about to give you a little bit of the overview of the NGO strategies for climate change. This, these strategies have already been implemented for many years throughout the civil society um, um, movement and civil society sector. And we're just gonna be briefing through this just to have a little bit of an overview, different examples of what the different strategies are, are, um, are in present. Uh, we'll give you a short or several projects that I chose to demonstrate with the game-changing models from Israel and worldwide. And if we have a little bit of time, we'll talk about the models for social struggles. Um, and then what I think through my research and through my encounters with the NGOs um, will be the game-changing um, 
what will take this environmental Israeli environmental movement to its next level. I chose to um, to use these categories through um, through one uh, through a book uh, that is written by Ishai Menuchin, and because I think that encompasses most of the strategies that NGOs uses in their um, in their social change uh, efforts. It doesn't encompass every every strategy, but I think it gives an, a, an, an overview and a, a good example for most of them. You have to remember that most of the NGOs don't choose one strategies. When they start, and this is I encounter a lot when I when I talk to new NGOs and new new groups, civil society groups, when they start, they try everything. They want to do this and this and this and and most of the time it doesn't work. They don't have the capacity. We're talking about five or 10 groups of people and they don't have the capacity to work through all of them. And while they grow and they change and they become more established, then they become more focused on three, maybe, maybe four uh, strategies depending on how big the, the NGO is. Just as a brief overview, um, of course, the first one, the first, oh, sorry. The first one is initiating new organization. So we have uh, a Knesset member called Alon Tal. I don't know if you know him, he's Professor Alon Tal. He's been initiating <laughs> at least five or four NGOs in Israel. So what he does, he just creates NGOs. It's, um, it, um, it can be, a national NGO, a local NGO, or an international, even Greenpeace, is just um, bringing a group of people and then and then working and then um, building their their um, their abilities and their um, strategies. The next one is the capacity building. Of course, um, several NGOs just do capacity building. 350.org. They go through different countries, they develop the, the local chapter, and then they give them training, they give them guidance, they give them um, different, like, uh, sorry. They give them different workshop for them to be able to perform. Another one is raising awareness, civic education. It's a little bit different from protest and nonviolent civil resistance, because this is uh, more of giving voice for the knowledge so transparency is more about transparency. It's more about um, we bring you the knowledge and then you can do whatever you do. So the more aware the audience is, the, the strategies is aiming to the more knowledge, the better, the better you can act as a civil society, uh, individual or groups. Another one is the legal and constitution action. Who um, I don't know who knows Adam Tevavedin. They just do through the justice system. They do prosecution. They uh, do uh, lawsuits and also um, also uh, laws and um, yeah, they try to move move forward laws mm -hmm. in the Knesset in Israel. Civil civic advocacy is is more uh, referring to um, representing groups of interest groups within the national authorities, whether it's the Knesset or the or the even the, um, the municipality. Uh, another good example of that is Lobby 99, whoever know, who, who knows them. It's a it's a civil society lobby group group that is very, very democratic and the, their members are choosing which topics the, um, the NGO will be pursuing in the next few years. Promoting civic uh, represent, uh, participation in key decision-making and promoting civic representation in decision-making bodies. It's a little bit different. It's, it's whether it's an, uh, a project base that is a round table or um, committees that are discussing, uh, Knesset committees that are discussing specific issues, and then that's they invite the civil society people to come and say their say and give their opinion, professional opinion. That's the 
the participation and the representation is more of a permanent position within governmental and um, in institutional bodies that uh, for example what we do and then i'll go i will talk to you a little bit about that in the game changing ones models um what life and environmental do environment do is they have representative of civil society representative in the building and the um, the building and planning committees in israel um another one the building dialogue i think everyone can understand that through different sectors through different religions just creating um, a bottom-up idea and the protest non-violent civil resistance i don't think we have to um to say more about that so i was um through my work in life and environment, and when I was preparing for this chat, I've encountered several interesting projects that I believe will become game changing in the Israeli movement. And I chose to bring three, three from, um, from Israel and three from uh, worldwide. One is the divesting from fossil fuel clean money forum. I think the next chat will be with one representative of that. Uh, what I would say is the fact that um, there are a lot of groups around the world, but in Israel have they have a lot of achievements already, already uh, financial financial groups, financial bodies already declared that they want to divest their investment from uh, an already existing project, uh, fossil fuel project, or not investing in them. One of their most successful um, achievement for this group was the Tel Aviv 125 fossil free climate index, which you can invest as an individual and they will tell they, their that money goes to a fossil free um, a fossil free projects entirely so that's clean money for you. Um, another one is the Qatar Accord coalition that and refers to the building coalition in protests. Um, there's a huge project that comes from the Emirates and they wanna, the, the plan is to uh, build a pipeline or um, um, I don't know, what's the word I forget? To uh, upgrade. Upgrade. To upgrade, yes, to upgrade the, the pipeline that already exists between Elad and Ishtod, and then just to build, uh, to be a transfer, transfer um, station for the fuel from the Emirates to, to Europe. This is, of course, doesn't have any, any um, benefits to Israel in any way. So there's a coalition of 25 organizations, um, um, local and international and national organization that are forming together and working together in order for, um, for that accord to be um, banned. Another one is the representation model. Like I said before, this uh, say, sending the key agents, social, social, um, social change agents in key points, in key decision-making um, committees and then giving voice to us and then bringing back uh, to the civil society um, NGOs, bringing back information, inside information to plans, to um, any other issues that might rise up and then they can react according to it. From the world, I, I chose to bring three, which I think very, very interesting is why is Friday Future, I, I don't know if um, I'm, I'm assuming everyone knew Greta Thunberg. This is the huge movement that she built. Um, and then uh, around the world, she, she created something amazing. And that's mobilizing youth, which is like um, Sigal said at the beginning, this is a pr probably the last generation that are going to be not the last generation. We are the last generation. You can do th something. They are going to be the one that be affected most. Um, another one is the, is momentum. I don't know if anyone knows about them, but what they do 
is they do they are tra are a training institute and a movement incubator. They are building capacity for organization and progressive popular social movements. The, the, using their method, methodology are several really interesting and um, really interesting movements like Black Lives Matter, Sunrise, the Hong Kong Umbrella Movement. They are using their training and their capacity building um, uh, workshops and webinars, they're using their methodology to their within their movements. And I can honestly say that this is really, really interesting um, approach uh, that they are using. And then they are able to uh, really increase capacity of like one one of the um, one of their projects was the a day without immigrants that was that happened in, in 2017 in the US where thousands of immigrants uh, came across the US, um, took part in the largest immigration led actions. So they're doing a small, um, they're doing um, a capacity building, which are, which is amazing. It's mobilizing thousands of people. And um, the last one is Gen regeneration project. It's, um, it's as this project answers the basic, the most basic question that everyone says that when they start to be aware of climate change is what can I do in the most effective and fastest um, time? So, so they they have different topics. They deal with heat pumps and fifteen minute cities and eco um, eco eco um, agriculture. Uh, e agroecology, sorry. Um, and then they go through, they have a list. They have a list for individual, what they can do. And then you have a list for groups, what they can do. And then authority, what they can do. It's the, actually listing every solution that is possible and is around the world is collecting um, and then giving answers to people um, and what they can do. How long do I still have? Because I started the, the, the time a little bit. Three minutes. After. Three okay, so I won't go through the models for social struggle. I just want to um, say what I believe through my um, through my work and through my encounters with with dozens of NGOs, whether they're just starting or they're just um, or they've been around for a while. I think that divesting in largest on larger scales. I think this is a really major issue that we can um, help individuals can make it and bodies and in financial financial uh, movement and financial institutes and um, the establishment university, everyone can do that. Bringing more youth to the Israeli chapter. I think the Israeli chapter is, is um, struggling um, and not bringing the, the entire force with them, not enough youth are joining. And these are these are the voices that more, I think, political um, political uh, people can will will hear. And they're always referring to them. It's amazing the work that they're doing, the ones that are doing here in Israel, but we need more and more people. Another simplifying solution, I know just bringing all the solution together and then um, and then finding the ways to make them um, tra transparent, to make them um, uh, be more visible, to be more, um, um, so people can come and then there's a place and then they can see what they can do, they give them answer. Uh, building coalition, full spectrum technological engagement infrastructure. I, I'm, I would just want to refer on that. This basically is um, as an issue when when you when you try to mass mobilize all of Israel and Israel is a spread one. There are technological solutions that can help um, maintaining the the contact with the different with the different people in the different cities and the different issues. So helping us being able to digitally communicate more with the audience, I think will be um, will be a really game changing for the environmental movement. And 
at the end, I just wanted to have to, for you to see this, all things are connected, whatever, whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever, whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. I think that's pretty much sums all what we want to do and what we try to do here in Israel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Moran. You can stop by your screen share. Yeah, I'll just um, here. Thank you very much. So first of all, if any of you have questions, I had a few questions already um, written to me privately and I'll pose them to you. But if anyone else on the call has questions to Moran and later after to the two other speakers, feel free to note them in the chat and then we'll um, facilitate them to Moran. So one question that came up is, Regarding Israel's new formed government or newly formed government, do you see any um, opportunities with the government to, to work on the various fields that you pointed out in your presentation? I would say yes. I would say that this um, new government is mostly con uh, combined um, by politicians that don't they used used to be in opposition. They don't. They don't. They are not used to being a coalition, and they are not really understanding their power. And I think this is an opportunity for us to give them agendas to help them promote a lot of issues that they were always shouting from the opposition. And then they they need a change. And then now we can give them tools, and now we can lead them and give them more and more issues. Um, it's still difficult because it's a very fragile coalition, but I think there are a lot of opportunities. And I think there we have a lot of a lot more um, Knesset members and uh, parliament members that are not parliament, a governmental um, minister ministries ministers that are they have their ears to us. They are more oriented, civil society oriented than before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and a follow-up question that I know is related to much of the work that you've done over the past two, year, two 20 years or so that I've known you in the environmental movement. Often philanthropy looks at the national government and says it's too big for me to collaborate with the government. And more and more over the past years, and not only in the field of environment, in any field of social change, more and more of the eyes are focused on local municipalities and on cities in Israel as a sphere that's much easier to create change and then either scale it up or model it or push it bottom up towards the government. In the issue of climate change, do you see opportunities there? And if so, what? Firstly, I see, I think that what the Corona crisis created is that the, because there were two years that the national government was, weren't really functioning and we had that crisis, the Corona crisis, I think um, local, local, um, local authorities, mayors um, just took the power to themselves. So they just decided to, make, to, take, an act, to take action and they just said, well, the government doesn't, doesn't react. It takes too long. It doesn't give us answers. So we can't wait anymore. We need to give answers to our um, electorates. And so I think one of the, the really good issues that they, they did take a lot of, uh, of the power. And then we see that most of that, a lot of the power um, for decision-making and, um, and the, at the local level is, is there. So I think local um, NGOs and civil society groups have a lot of, a lot of influence in them because the electorate more, they're closer to their, to the elections we have in 2023 elections, local elections. And so a lot of the politicians, the local politicians have their ears to what the public wants. And so I think we can, as a civil society, um, we can use this opportunity to leverage the issues that we want to we want to build on. And I think yes, I think we the the government created the um, the, adapt, the adaptation plan or the adaptation plan for um, for climate crisis. 
And then they didn't do anything. There is no budget for it. And so uh, Tel Aviv and then Jerusalem. Now the local local um, cities, local mayors just take that program and try to translate it to their own because they know that they will they will deal with the issues themselves. They will deal with the fires, they will deal with the floods, they will deal with the sea, sea level, level rising. And then they have to, to give answers to people. And the more and more we use our voices, our local voices, I think will be more influential in the local level and then it will go up to the national one. It will be it will really interesting if, if in the elections of 2023, we do see an increase in their agendas and in the, uh, in the electoral votes. So that would be interesting. Another question we have here in the chat, how can we divest from fossil fuel companies when we are all dependent and use their products daily? I don't see the major lifestyle changes necessary to lessen increase in average global temperature. Okay. Any insights about that? It's maybe the million dollar question, but. Well, I have my ideas on the economic structure of, of the earth, <laughs> the, global, the global economy. And I think it doesn't work, but I think at, at, um, in our position, I think that the more we divest in less and less fossil fuel projects, the more incentive they will, the, the bigger conglomerate that that has a lot of pub, uh, um, political influence will be forced to work on solution and even reduce much more than they do now. So I think even when Exxon Mobil engine 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 number number one, the ones that the the hedge fund, the activist hedge fund that um, put two board members in, at Exxon Mobile. And then now they're trying to change, now they're trying to change that whole conglomerate into something that they, they invest more and more in, um, in renewable energy. I think most of the things that will force them to move to another solution will be divesting from their projects and not creating even more, yeah. which they're doing now. Okay, David yeah. will also pose that question to Yossi, our next speaker, who will also touch these issues. And maybe the last question, Moran, are there any NGOs in Israel working on reducing dependence on animal agriculture, educating about the impact of meat and dairy consumption on land, water, climate, et cetera? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So you wanna mention yeah. a little bit about the NGOs and the work that they do in that field? Yes. Um, okay. Well, we, there's um, there are NGOs that are really like um, in animal rights um, NGOs that mostly deal with farm animals, and then they're trying to reduce the the livestock um, um, import from different from from countries, different countries, mostly from Australia. But they do there there are a lot of, of work on that, and there's there's um, animals which was used to be um, um, anonymous. Animals is uh, is a it's it's a huge NGO that works on dairy farms and work on um, trying to close the um, the industry of um, raising pigs. Yes. Um, and also there are, what we're trying to create also is talk, just the, the thinking, we're creating a call, sorry, I will start again. In life and environment, we are trying to form a coalition on um, wildlife, um, poultry and wildlife um, 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 hunting. And even we were talking about um, fish and, and um, even ma marine wildlife and uh, land um, wildlife. And so there are several NGOs and there, some of them do really, really good job. Big and friendly are giving um, a lot of, um, they have their posters, they have their post and then they give um, um, kind of like, um, badges for for uh, businesses that are um, animal free or animal friendly 
Um, and so they're trying to influence the business community. There are NGOs that are um, um, working on the governmental issues and policy issues. So we do have a lot of a lot of NGOs. There are not many activists anymore. There used to be a lot more um, uh, activist uh, groups in the animal rights and the environmental issues towards uh, like the climate change um, um, climate change affected by animals farming. But we're working on that. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say, Leanne, that if you have follow up questions, Gil and I are open to help consulting to all of the participants on these calls regarding follow up issues and questions that come up about groups in Israel and and grant making around those fields in Israel. So we can definitely set up a, a follow up call if you want with us after. Um, there are a few questions. We don't have time to answer all of them. Um, maybe one last one. Um, better than NGOs, Michael Lustig noted here, there are for profit companies that focus on agri-tech, food tech, creating sustainable meat substances, uh, substitutes, reducing food waste, et cetera, actual real world solutions that are inherently sustainable um, as they're the main focus of operating companies. Yeah, that's not, uh, not really a question, but absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I think that's also I was um, I was me uh, I've been meaning to talk about it when we talk about dialogue and cross sector dialogue. I think also the civil society NGOs and environmental movement needs to focus a little bit more, a uh, more uh, with the discourse with businesses and um, clean tech um, NGOs and entrepreneurs and to bring the solution if we want to bring the solution to one place for a per person who wants to, to know what he can do, then um, I think we need to discuss a lot more on how businesses can change their um, their day to day and then what clean tech we can promote and what other um, solutions that we can offer. We have a lot in Israel, it's a startup nation. So I think that we can the the combination the discussion between the civil society and the businesses and the um entrepreneurship and um, in, um entrepreneurship sector can be a lot more um established uh, a lot more um yeah yeah um can organize maybe. <laughs> okay moran thank you so much thank you very Marie. much for the opportunity and uh, to the discussion to be continued, of course. Uh, so thanks for joining us. I'm now happy to introduce our next speaker, Yossi Kadan um, from Climate Finance. Um, he's a senior strategist at the Sunrise Project. Just to make clear, this is different than the Sunrise Movement. This is the Sunrise Project. Joining us from Canada, Yossi is a longtime environmental and peace activist. He spent 30 years of his life in various positions in the environmental movement, both in Israel and abroad. Amongst those, a global finance campaign manager at 350.org, leading Greenpeace's Canada program, serving as the executive director of WildSight and as a regional conservation director at the SPNI, the Society of Protection of Nature in Israel. Yossi also represented Israel's environmental NGOs at the multilateral peace talks between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. The Sunrise Project sits in, at the intersection of social movements and philanthropy and will speak to us about climate finance strategies. Yossi, thank you for joining us. And I would say that some of the questions that were posed in the chat to Moran are actually very naturally fit to your conversation. So we might loop back to them at the end of your um, talk. So go ahead. Thank you very much, Sigal. And uh, I'm happy to answer the questions about ESGs and everything else that uh, you know just pop up in the chat uh, and to say why ESG is more a problem than a solution. But anyway, that's for probably later on. At this point, let me just share my screen. Excellent. So I'm uh, going to speak about the global fi uh, climate finance campaign. Um, it's uh, a campaign that started, I think, um, stronger uh, in 2009 in the wake of the Copenhagen uh, COP that um, you know everybody had a lot of expectations and we all, I think came out from this conference feeling feeling really bad that there was no progress and we uh, you know in general I mean like the climate movement was 
sort of feeling like crossroad where we are going from from here now i mean like it's it was um it was sort of about uh, i would say close to 15 years of negotiations between at that point between countries and uh it seems like it's not going anywhere i mean like the political the political movement is not doing enough and not taking the necessary changes that we need in order to tackle the climate crisis uh with that in mind um you know sort of brilliant and smart people start to think about so what we do how we can actually i mean like accelerate the the change to what we are needing um and one of the solution is is to try to look at the power centers where are the power centers how the political how politics and uh, you know are making those decisions on wh what regulations and where they should go and it was clear that the fossil fuel industry is the major problem it's the major industry that we know that causing uh close to sort of more than 60 percent of the climate catastrophe of climate crisis and responsible for also lobbying against uh, against any regulations or anything that comes with that um okay so what was the uh, sort of the theory of change why we decided to embark on this campaign one is that fossil fuel is the number one the driver of the climate crisis I, as i just said it's more than 60 percent of the emissions are coming from fossil fuels we all know that um, the fossil fuel industry uh, is putting a lot of efforts and resources into blocking any climate action because any climate action is bad for their businesses so a lot of lobbying and we know the numbers i mean like exxon um, mobile sort of uh, lobbied the uh, us government for years not to do not to take any action so uh, it's important really to tackle this issue um so and the idea is that we want to uh, remove the pillar of support for fossil fuel while driving deployment in alternative and renewable energies that we are talking um and the other thing i mean like that everybody feels that the social movement are proven to be powerful i mean like we were able to um, make new changes in in various aspects in the in the last few years uh and the idea that if we will be able to have aligned and connected and growing mostly growing network of uh, diverse actors we we can actually overcome the vested interests that um uh, that are happening with the uh um and that really influenced by the uh fossil fuel industry so how everything started it's let me just just okay so i will maybe um so how everything is started and i will want to show you a short video it's a four minutes video that can explain much better than me about how everything is uh, started and also will give some answers about the divestment questions that you have earlier in the conversation uh but just to say um that the campaign on sort of what we call the finance which i think it's completely different today from what it was in 2009 uh didn't started um as uh, as a finance campaign per se so there was no intention at the beginning uh or not or we thought that we can't really uh drive or bankrupt exxon and 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 alike just because we know how much money they have and how uh, much liquid their assets could be in many ways so the campaign was really focused on trying to um i would say dismantle the uh, uh the legitimacy of the fossil fuel industry and and it was in essence it was a social and political campaign more than anything that finance campaign um so i i will just try to summarize that so as i said i mean like the the, the movement started uh in 2009 it was an initiative of a small group of people that uh, at this point were not a, a really organization it was like eight people from one of the college in in, in vermont led by Bill McKibben, and they say basically two things. One is that if the fossil fuel really are responsible for um, destroying our climate, then nobody can morally can continue and invest in this industry that actually, I mean, like causing so many problems and cause, causing the climate crisis. The second thing was that um, it, it was sort of a financial argument. If you look at the um, 
at what the fossil fuel industry is planning uh, and what they have on their reserve in terms of extraction, uh, it's way more than we that we we can burn uh, if we want to have the climate uh, stabilized. So we are talking about about at that point in 2010, it was about five times more than what we can burn. Uh, and the idea is that if your um, assets or your shares are invested in in these proven results that we can burn, then uh, and if government will take the action that it's needed to avert cl the climate crisis, this money basically is uh, is hold on some on nothing, and because of that, um, this money is not is not going to be materialized, and therefore you should divest also from uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, with that in mind, I mean, like the movement started in the U.S. mostly in uh, in, in campuses and universities, uh, but uh, you know, short shortly after that, it's really catch like fire and uh, expand to pension funds, uh, state funds, and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, with sort of a movement that I think, in my opinion, at least, um, you know, knowing the climate movement for many years, it's probably the biggest uh, it, biggest uh, climate movement and the most successful climate movement that was at this point. Um, and the movement was able to, um, you know, uh, get the numbers, the current numbers of the institution who divested, it's actually close to, or decided to divest for some form of fossil fuels, it's around 1500. Um, and from different 60 different countries and I, I, the assets under management that all these uh, institutions co collectively have, it's about $49 trillion. It's not the money that actually divested from fossil fuels. I'm talking about the, uh, the value of all these uh, institutions who decided to divest from fossil fuels. So the impact was pretty large, uh, I think, both in the social and political to delegitimize the, uh, um, the industry. But also um, something that wasn't expected, it's actually had an impact on the financials of the fossil fuels and mostly on coal. We know that coal, it's a sort of a really hard sell now and uh, not so many, uh, and it's really expensive for the coal industry to get loans or to get any, uh, uh, any way of uh, finance to their businesses. Again, I mean, like the idea that there are a few, a three centers of power that uh, that you need to impact if you want to uh, achieve any any climate. Uh, uh, I would say uh, any any one of the objectives in our to avoid the climate crisis, and that include governments, obviously that regulate uh, corporations, finance sector, and civil society. Uh, shifting capital is about removing the financial pillars of support for the fossil fuel industry. And we want to stop new projects because, according to any uh, all the uh, uh, all the science today, we can't really add any uh, new fossil fuel projects. We have actually to start to phase out some of the existing projects, but definitely no space for any new projects. Um, and the idea is to, by working on finance, we will be able to deny access to debt finance, to other form of uh, of uh, investments capital. Uh, also insurance and other financial services, including corporate finance and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the current targets that are, are now in the, uh, in the focus of the, of the, I would say, climate finance movement are several. One is the insurance industry. We all know that without insurance, uh, no fossil fuels projects can be approved. Uh, it's a must for any projects that happen anywhere in, in the globe. Uh, the second uh, is big assets manager, um, namely BlackRock and Vanguard. BlackRock is the, the biggest asset manager in the world. I think the recent number is about sort of assets, uh, managed assets of about $10 trillion. And the biggest uh, contributor to uh, fossil, the fossil fuel industry. So the idea is to uh, move BlackRock. If we move BlackRock and we move Vanguard, one of the uh, sort of the two biggest asset manager, we actually uh, will stop a lot of the potential for finance for the fossil fuel industry. The other aspect is assets owner, pension funds, state funds. They all uh, stakeholders in uh, also have stakes in various fossil fuels, but also they have a huge influence on the assets manager as, as they are. 
uh, private financial institutions, banks are the worst, um, as are the worst, and they, and they definitely are the one that uh, I would say enable the, the fossil fuel industry to continue to do what they are doing now. Um, and then sort of public financial institutions, we are at Sunrise, we are not really doing work on that, but there is sort of a big uh, group and a big uh, coalition that working on the World Bank, credit agencies, and other public financial institutions within the countries. Uh, and then, you know, I would say it's last year, but probably not least in terms of the importance is the financial regulator, like central banks, because financial regulators make can make the banks and any and any other mechanism by by uh, enforcing regulations that uh, will not able to to uh, will not able banks to give uh, or to continue to give loans to the fossil fuel industry. Among the regulations is also the SEC in the U.S. Uh, that also regulate um, some some of the banks' work um, um, in, in in that place. I'll just resume. Um, so want to talk about uh, a few wins. So because everybody is, so we're doing all that work, uh, what that means and are we going anywhere? <laughs> you know, generally I would say, you know, everybody's uh, knowing what's happening now. We see the floods happening. We just saw yesterday the big tornado in, um, in the US that killed more than 70 people. So I would say that um, the fight for climate cri crisis is not about if it will happen. You know, at some point we will all to move to renewable energy because it's, it will be cheaper, it, it makes sense. And in everything that you can think about, the problem is that is about how fast we will move there. Um, and if we are not going to move fast enough, then there is no point for that. I mean, like if we will move, uh, to the, uh, to have all our energy sources from renewable by the end of the century, we're doomed anyway. So uh, so it's about the timing more than anything. And I would say generally that we are winning a lot of battles, but in I would say that in 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 the big picture we are losing sort of the um, uh, the fight. So uh, which is which is not good, and therefore we have really to continue and press uh, forward. But sample of wind is the World Bank announcement in 2019 that they're not going to continue to invest in upstream oil and gas. Uh, we all know that the major, most major European insurance, including AXA, including others, uh, are not underwriting any more coal projects. So that's sort of, uh, and now we're moving, um, uh, working hard on the US ones. Uh, another one, BlackRock. I mean, like, you know, when we started the campaign on BlackRock, I mean, like, we were we were actually, I mean, like, thinking about, we're talking about BlackRock. It's actually coal. So how come, you know, it seems like it will be almost impossible to move that, that giant, but um, they're moving, not enough fast as we want, but definitely sort of we are moving, they're moving. Uh, they have uh, issued several statements on, on, on climate issue. They were su more supportive on climate related proposal in the last year. Um, definitely an increase. We, and we hope that this year they will increase their participation and, and involvement in, in that sphere. Um, you know, it was mentioned before about NG number one, uh, the uh, activist investor OTS, the uh, two least to Exxon director in the historic pro-climate move. Um, banks, uh, not always, but uh, at least in France, uh, big banks like BNP Paribas and others all excluded the coal mines, plants and infrastructure and are moving actually to exclude more uh, fossil fuels. Um, and the last one in this list is the US Central Bank historically conservative uh, and dogmatically committed. Uh, um, it says that it's putting climate change, it's, it's a main and overarching issue in, in for, the next, uh, uh, for the next generation. So I think I'm done here um, and I'm happy to answer questions as sort of as, as the time will allow. So if we, we scroll a little bit back to the, um, the questions and you mentioned it a little bit at the beginning of ESGs, there's a big market now for ESG funds in uh, ETFs. Can that be harnessed more successfully? And I already, from your little remark at the beginning, I understood that you have a critical uh, observation of ESGs. So maybe uh, 
answer that question first? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like ESGs could be good if they were regulated in some way that actually, you know, put a real benchmark about what is ESG and what is not. The problem is now that ESG are not regulated. So the ESG that you can find, you know, BlackRock will issue and ESGs that other assets owner will issue will be completely different. And I would say that lots of the ESGs contain fossil, contain fossil fuels. So if your intention is actually not to continue it, uh, and finance fossil fuels, it's not going to achieve that because through ESGs, you, you will continue to be uh, invested in, in various fossil fuels, depends on the ESG that you find. Um, the, the, the big problem is that is that sort of it's a misleading because as an investor, you think that, okay, um, I'm actually doing good if I'm um, buying ESGs. Uh, and I'm sort of avoiding or not contributing to the climate crisis. But uh, on, on the other hand, I mean, like, that's not what you're doing. So it's sort of, I would say, we definitely can include that at this point in the, uh, in sort of, in the um, uh, sort of maybe uh, classify it as a greenwash, I think, more than anything. Uh, and unless there will be some stricter regulations and benchmark about what consider to be SDGs at this point, they're not really supporting or helping to solve the climate crisis. Okay, thank you. Another question we have is, what do you think about the potential of using these strategies that you mentioned uh, along your presentation in Israel, with Israel civil society? I think, I think there's sort of, there is a great potential. I mean, like as far as I know, but correct me if I'm wrong because I'm, I'm not there for sort of many years now. Um, I'm not sure that there is sort of any campaign on banks uh, about sort of bank lending in Israel. I think that sort of have a, a great potential. Um, I'm also really encouraged by the fact, you know, looking at the divestment campaign and, and seeing that there are uh, various um, um, pensions at this point that are offering uh, fossil free investments, which is really hard, was really hard to get in other places in the world, but I think relatively, but maybe I'm wrong, I don't know how much, uh, you know, efforts went into that, but uh, it seems like it went, you know, relatively easy in Israel, so I do think, and then I think the next step will be is, is to harness this participation in these fossil fuels uh, sort of all, all, all these pension funds to uh, actually voice their opinion, sort of, and uh, uh, and be and participate more on on sort of as the shareholders in various in, could be in banks, could be in in other places. But I think that's still to be done. So beyond just sort of offering fossil free um, investments, uh, using sort of using them as a as a champions, I would say at this point to put the pressure on other institutions. Again, I'm not really aware, but I'm not sure how much, you know, there is an active work around shareholders in Israel uh, in AGMs and resolutions. And I think that there is a lot of space to grow that area and, you know, to have an, a huge influence where needed. I agree that the, these tactics or, you know, activism methods have not really made Aliyah to Israel yet so much. We, we don't see them that often. It's interesting to think why. We have two Davids uh, posting two questions here in the chat. Uh, one is, has there been any measurement or study of how successful your type of NGO has been? Um, my NGO, I mean, like I work at the Sunrise Project, which is, um, yeah, as I said, I mean, like it's it's an interesting beast because we're sitting between uh, no, between Yossi, the foundation. You, can Yossi, can go, I interrupt? You? Go ahead. What you, is your type of NGO? Is an NGO which is devoted to campaigning directly um, mm -hmm. against the fossil fuel producers, as opposed to other methods of of uh, fighting fossil fuels. Has there been an, an also divestment? How much carbon have you reduced by that? Do you know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a tough question. I don't think that sort of you know you can measure that. I mean, like, and how much carbon was reduced because of our work? How much carbon was reduced because of X work? And how much carbon was reduced by COVID? Because obviously, we know that in the COVID year, the financial or the industrial, um, I, I would say, activities. Thought... The, the issue is, is on the, the, the two things you're doing. One thing you're doing is you're 
wanting to reduce their share price. How mm -hmm. much is the reduction of the share price, and it has gone down, has affected the policy of, and that can, that is something very interesting. It's the first time, you know, it's very rare that a boycott of a company has taken place of a big capitalist company. And that's quite interesting is how much is affected that and that can be measured. So I'm just curious to know, but if it's not effective, then you should, we should be doing something else and, and not bothering with it. If they're ignoring the fact that we are not buying their shares, then let's do something more effective. Um, I don't think they're ignoring the fact that we are not. No, I, um, I don't believe they do, but. You have yeah. to measure that. You have to measure that. It's very nice to feel good, but if it's not affecting climate change, then all we're doing is just feeling good, and that's not. Yeah, good but yeah, definitely that's not good enough. But you can you can see. I mean, like you know, the coal industry, for example. We know that the coal industry is basically now collapsing. You know, we see so many uh, so many coal, in, coal corporations, both in the U.S. but also in other parts of the world, are basically bankrupting. And coal, we know in terms of fossil fuel, it's the most, you know, they were the biggest contributor to the fossil fuels, uh, to CO, CO2. So the, the question will be, are we having less fossil, sort of less emission from coal? Yes, we have. But uh, I think when, when we will come to the next few years and there won't be any, any new coal uh, power plants, then we'll see a bigger drop in terms of the emissions. So that's, you know, you can definitely, if you measure that even through that, you can say that the campaign was successful in actually dismantle this industry. I mean, like dismantle the coal industry and they, you know, for coal, wherever you go, I mean, like it's almost impossible to get an insurance. Uh, most of the insurance company will not sort of underwrite you if you are a coal industry, if you want to open a coal plant. Um, it will be really difficult to get loan because most of the banks, even the ones that don't have a direct policy on calls are really reluctant in terms of uh, giving loans to, to call. And if you get loan, it will be very expensive. Then it puts in a question mark, any sort of uh, development. I would say that at this point, the only place that you can get some support for call is from some of the Japanese bank and mostly sort of from China. But we know President Xi just um, a month ago basically say China stop financing any, any, uh, any new call um, not inside China. So yeah, so this here you go. You have a material sort of impact and clearly. Thank you, Yossi. Thank you, David, for your question. We have several other great questions, but we ran out of time for your section. So we'll try to circle back maybe at the end if we have time, and if not during the next session, because some of these questions will continue to come up. So thank you, Yossi, for the work that you're doing and the presentation. Hopefully we'll see more of these strategies also entering Israel's and Israel's uh, civil society. So we're now moving to our final speaker who will you. inspire us with the activism of youth globally and in Israel on climate change. Um, I'm happy to introduce to you 14 years old Nomi Rosenberg from Strike for Israel, Strike for Future Israel, Youth for Climate Israel. Nomi lives in Ramat Gan, studies philosophy in uh, Young Spirit, Ruach Tzaira, a program for outstanding students in the humanities. Nomi also studies history and political science in the Open University, and in her spare time, enjoys hiking in nature. So Nomi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, okay, so can you all see the presentation? Wait, I can't even see. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so I'll start by talking about Fridays for Future. Um, I assume everyone has heard of Fridays for Future or at least about um, Greta Thunberg. So if you haven't, Greta was a 16 year old girl in 2018. She understood that her life was in danger, in actual danger. And so she decided to do something about it. She decided to strike from school for every single day. And from 2018 till now, the movement has grown to be uh, active in all continents in over uh, 7,500 7, cities and has more than 14 million members. Um, the targets of the movement, Fridays for Future, is our declaration of a climate emergency and climate justice for all. 
Um, so how did I find out about Strike for Future? I'll start by talking about how actually I found out about climate change. So it was in June this year when I firstly heard about um, the wildfires in California. I thought to myself, what is the cause of the wildfires? I didn't know, so I had to search it online. And after like five minutes of researching, I found out about this term, climate change. I've never heard about it before in my life. After 30 minutes of researching about climate change, I understood that my life is in danger. I understood that I had to take action now. And I also thought to myself, why isn't my school teaching me about this huge thing that would probably destroy my life if the governments don't do anything? And um, after some more research, I found out about Strike for Future, which is the Israeli branch of Fridays for Future. So Strike for Future has members from all over the country, Israel. Um, all members are aged between 11 and 18. And, and on top of the 600 members we have, we have around 3,000 teen supporters that come to our protests and um, all sorts of stuff. And, um, and we also have 10 cities with the weekly protests. So every Friday in 10 cities, we protest. Our targets for the Israeli government are mandatory education on climate change to all students in Israel, meaning students won't have to experience what I experienced. They wouldn't have to research about this threat by themselves because they'd be taught about it from the age of six um, till they're 18. We also promote a move to 100% renewable energies by 2050 and 50% renewable energies by 2030. And um, putting the climate crisis in the public discourse. So how do we promote these targets? Firstly, through social media. So you could probably, a lot of, um, a big chunk of teens, a teen's life is scrolling through TikTok or Instagram. So we think to ourselves, okay, we have to educate these teens about this huge threat. What is a good way to do it? Well, through putting our videos on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Actually, a lot of um, our members came through TikTok and Instagram. They saw a post of ours or a video and they thought to themselves, okay, this is a huge thing. I have to join and help. Another way is through protests and demonstrations. Um, as an example, um, in, on the first day of uh, the, the school year, we protested in front of the Minister of Education, uh, as you can see here, and to, to basically ask for a meeting with her to promote mandatory education on climate change. And we actually met with her last week. And another, like, that, that's like our most of our pro protests and demonstrations are more to like educate the public, educate people about what is happening. Like this is a picture from uh, the climate march that was in October. In the climate march, there were at least 5,000 teens, which is, an impressive number in comparison of other um, demonstrations, climate demonstrations in Israel. And we helped to actually organize it. Um, another way we do, um, we promote um, our targets is through civil lobby. So this is a picture from uh, last week when we met the Minister of Education. And we also speak in committees in the Knesset, like here and here. And actually today we spoke about, uh, in a committee about gas, natural gas, just today. And tomorrow, uh, one of our members is going to talk about um, climate depression. And this is a picture from the Environment Day at the Knesset, where we actually walked around the halls of the Knesset and asked ministers and members of parliament to take a picture with the sign that says 50% renewable energies by 2030 and 100% by 2050 as a way to support, as they support our um, goal for renewable energies. 
Uh, the last method we use that I'm going to talk about is teaching lessons on climate change. So like our members go to schools and classes and teach their peers about climate change. So it could actually be quite funny at times. Like I remember that two weeks ago, a 12 year old, um, a member of our um, movement went to a class of 17 year olds. So she, a 12 year old taught much older kids. Um, from one, one side, it is kind of funny. From the other, it's sad that she has to teach them and because the Ministry of Education doesn't do anything about it. Um, and how we cooperate with other organizations. So we take part in FFF, Fridays for Future, Global Strikes, as you can see here. And it's a very important part of what we do. And we also cooperate with other climate organizations inside of Israel, like Green Course or XR Israel. Actually, we were founded by, they helped found us, Green Course actually helped found us. And this is the picture from the very first meeting in 2019 with Green Course and uh, in Bao Vesli, which was the founder of Strike for Future. Another picture from the Environment Day in the Knesset, where you can see us with different, um, with representatives of different climate organizations. So this is the essence of all I want to say. It's our future and it's our last chance to save it. So we call to our government to take immediate climate action, immediate. And all we want to say is just do something now, act now, because there, there isn't going to be time later. Naomi, thank you so much. It's amazing that you're only 14, really. You're, you're so articulate and passionate. And it's, uh, and it's amazing that you only got involved not so long ago and you feel like you've been doing this your whole life. At least that's how you come across. So first of all, thank you for the work that you do. I'm reminding everyone we have a few more minutes if you want to post questions to Naomi. And we already have one question. And that's, what do you expect us, the older generation, to do? about climate change to do now. You have a room, a virtual room here full of uh, members of the philanthropic community that are based all over in the US and in Israel. And what, what, tell us what you expect us to do. Well, firstly, you can take part in activism. That's, that's a good way to, to, to actually change things. Go to protests, um, maybe spread it around your community. Maybe teens in your communities don't know about this huge threat that's threatening us. That's the first thing. Um, the second is obviously donating to organizations like, I guess, Fridays for Future, maybe our organization, or all sorts of different organizations based in all around the world, really. Okay, we have another question here from David. Do you see your peers changing their lifestyle to consume less energy? This also relates to the last question that we had to Yossi and didn't have time to, to um, answer it then, but the biggest obstacle is really changing our behavior. So do you see your peers changing their lifestyle? Well, I don't think that's the biggest obstacle. I think the, the biggest, I don't think it's the biggest cause to climate change. Like if everyone would become vegetarian, it would obviously help, but if the governments move towards, um, you know, renewable energies that would help much more. And I do see my peers moving to more, well, um, less prevalent using of energy lifestyles. Like I see more and more teens moving to a vegetarian uh, diet and um, using more bikes instead of driving their cars. Okay. Another question we have is, where do you see yourself? If all of this happened to you in less than a year, where do you see yourself in two, three years in regard to this climate change battle? Well, hopefully Israel will set great goals and everyone 
every single student in Israel would have a climate education. We're actually, we're working on that. I think, I think it would happen. Um, I'm still quite new to activism, so I might be just a little bit optimistic. Um, yeah, but hopefully it would actually happen. And with your help, it could happen. Yeah. You have to be optimistic for, <laughs> to be an activist. So good for you that you are. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to quickly say, first of all, thank you. You've been great. And I want to say to everyone that we, 20 years ago, when I started working with Israel's environmental movement, we had a, a, a retreat of two days or three days of all of the environmental leaders with the nonprofits in Israel. And the first circle of introductions was everyone had to say when and where they recall first feeling connected to nature, which led to them becoming environmental leaders. And almost everyone in that circle shared an experience of wandering off in the orchards and the trees by the beach, finding a turtle near, a turtle near, next to their house when they were wandering after school, or just getting lost in the woods and feeling like immersed in nature. And the observation then 20 years ago is, if Israel's growing so rapidly and urban sprawl everywhere, um, and we're not going to have open spaces that kids can wander about. Where are the next future leaders of Israel's environmental movement or the global movement going to come from if our youth doesn't have that experience? And it's dawning on me now listening to you that it's not coming out of necessarily having this beautiful experience in nature. It comes out of being aggravated or seeing fires. And this is really, I'm, I feel the need to apologize to you on behalf of our generation that this is, you know, this is what's generating your activism, but it's filling me with hope to see what you're doing and to see the energy you're bringing into this um, with the work that you're doing. Um, so I'd like to hand it over, Marla, to you. I mean, there, I see there are a few more um, said here, as far as I know, all moving to vegetarian diets. Um, oops, it ran too quickly. You got your... Uh, would have the same impact as moving to green energy and to be realized much faster. Okay, there and there are other, we'll, we'll save some of the major points from the chat and share them with you in a follow up email. So, Marla, in order for us to keep in the time frame, I'm handing it over to you and thank you again, Nomi. Yes, thank you. That was uh, really wonderful. In fact, I want to thank all three speakers, Moan, uh, Yossi, Nomi, and Nomi, just to say that I went to a great. Um, protest this morning. It was actually the beginning of the Knesset uh, uh, lobby um, in the hills of Jerusalem, and which has been a youth-led campaign and so completely inspiring. Um, uh, Alon Tal uh, organized the event, but the speaker of the Knesset was there and dozens of activists and the youth in this campaign has, has just been, I mean, really as an adult active in the environmental movement, we really need your energy and we're just so grateful for all that the youth are doing. And uh, we hope to see this movement grow more and more. And uh, I kind of apologize on behalf of uh, the boomers, we boomers. Um, I also, I, and I wanted just to say, I wanted to respond to something about Yossi, but I didn't get a chance. I just put in the chat, um, I'm also really frustrated with the ESG space. It's something everybody talks about. And truthfully, most of the funds that I've looked at are total greenwash. And I just wanna say, um, I've my husband and I helped co-found an ESG fund that we believe has real data, real ESG, real impact, uh, much lower GS, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I don't want to over advertise. Obviously, we're personally involved, but you can see in the chat, one of the things you as a buyer, you must really be buyer beware. Open the holdings in your ETFs. Make your investment managers look at the holdings and you'll see a lot of times it has complete overlap with the parent index. So I'm finding more and more it really is up to you, the investor to really actually make sure that your investment manager, like make sure your investment manager knows that you're checking his or her work. That's really critical. And again, in the chat, you can uh, feel free to look, uh, contact me personally. So we hope that you've gained some insights from these sessions. Um, I wanna also just say that a lot of this information is overwhelming and the Green Funders Forum is here to be a resource for you wherever you are in the journey. And we presume that most of you are not yet involved in environmental funding. And in order for you to dip your toe, we are offering free consultations um, with uh, Gil Yaakov, who's the consultant to the Green Funders Forum, and uh, also with Sigal. There is absolutely no obligation 
to start funding. I think it's just a way for us to help you integrate the information and to meet you where you are, to answer the questions that you have, see where the environment can intersect with what you're already funding or how you can become involved. So um, really, we would really love for you to take advantage of that. And personally, it makes me feel like my own impact is increased. So you can um, kind of give me a new year, end of the year present by actually participating in a consultation. Please feel free to contact us to arrange that. Um, we do have two more sessions for this climate change series. The next one will be on January 10th. Uh, again, at seven o'clock Israel time, it's philanthropic responses, lessons and opportunities. And the fifth and final session on February 14th, which yes, is Valentine's Day. And somebody suggested that we change it, but I actually think it would be a great thing to do on Valentine's Day, to show our care and concern for the planet. So I hope uh, you will join us on February 14th for where do we go from here, the role of the Jewish philanthropic community both as individuals and collectively. So um, with that, we will um, get back to you. Um, it will get back to you uh, with uh, more information, first of all, with the recording of this session, as well as the registration links. Um, Gil may have already put that in the chat. And again, please let us know if you can attend. Actually, we appreciate it even if you could tell us no, because I do try to follow up and it will save me from having to follow up with you. And uh, again, thanks so much, Sigal. Thanks so much, Gil, and all of the participants, and certainly to our speakers, Moran, Yossi, and Nomi. Good evening, everyone.